Your friends are scrolling through short content, but you, my friend, you're here to learn. Welcome to the RS Clips. We're taught a version of history in our history books, and I've had lots of historians as well as geopolitical observers on the show who say that we've probably been taught a morphed version of history, which celebrates certain individuals, which uh, kind of rejects other individuals. Now, I'll give you what I remember about Pakistani history from my schooling in India. I'd also love to know what someone my age would have studied in Pakistan about their own history and about India. We know that uh, Jinnah was a freedom fighter. Uh, what we're taught in uh, school is that he was kind of very in sync with working with the leaders of the Indian freedom struggle that we hear about in India. That's uh, Gandhiji, Jawaharlal Nehru, etc. And eventually, somewhere in the 1930s or 40s, there was this whole uh, rise of his political party. I can't remember the name. The All India Muslim League. Yeah, uh, the Muslim League. And that was where this idea of Pakistan began. Uh, and eventually in 1947, because of the differences between the Indian faction and his faction, it led to the creation of Pakistan. Now, there have also been some conspiracy theories that have been brought up on the show, which say that both Gandhiji, as well as Jawaharlal Nehru, as well as uh, Jinnah, were all sort of agents of the British. And uh, you, would you like to say anything about this? Uh, if you don't mind, yeah, it's sure. a very simplistic and distorted view of what actually happened. Okay. Yeah, sure. Please correct me. I'm here to learn. You know, like, the whole movement for Pakistan started by a section of the Muslim elite in North India because they had lost power and patronage due to the long decline of the Mughal Empire and the growing influence of the British. Right. So long as this Muslim elite in the North had power and patronage, they did not think they were a minority. They started feeling a minority when they no longer enjoyed that power and patronage because Mughals had declined on one side, the Maratha had risen, and the British were moving from the east. And when this talk started of representative government, one man, one vote, then they suddenly realized that we are in a minority. We will be overwhelmed by the Hindu majority if every man has a vote. That is when this feeling of being minority, persecution, and we want special protection started. He's the first person who articulated this was a Sayyid Ahmed Khan in the 1890s. And he said, it's like, I have four dice. I mean, the Hindus have four dice and I have only one. Obviously, the man of the four dice is going to win. The same thing was done by Jinnah in the 1940s. When, he, when Gandhiji said, we are brothers. He said, but you have three dice and I have only one. Quantitatively speaking, is that accurate? Though? Yes, yes. This is, like, this is actually what happened. Okay. See, nobody knew how a representative government will actually work. They presumed that all Hindus will vote for a Hindu and all Muslims will vote for a Muslim. What happens then? Mm. Because they're in a minority, the Hindus would always win. So that was one, let's say one bucket. The feeling of alienation of being a minority among the Muslims. Mm. Okay. The second bucket is the British. Now there, initially when the movement for self-government, etc. was... Uh, increasing, you know, restiveness amongst the uh, Hindus after 1957, they started started the Congress. So A.O. Hume set up the Congress that it will be a debating society where the Hindus can let off steam. But just so happens that Muslims too started gravitating towards the Congress. Then the British realized, this is a problem. Because they had identified after 1857 that were the Hindus and Muslims to come together, it is the end of the British Raj. Therefore, the differences between the Hindus and Muslims, the social differences, the cultural differences, must be escalated to the political and constitutional level. That will keep them apart. This is roughly when? After 1857. Oh, okay. So, okay. Wow. Right. So, this led finally to three events in the early 1900s. First was the partition of Bengal. Because Bengal was where the real uh, you know, movements had started. So when you partition into East and West Bengal, the Muslim portion went, just that you created one barrier between the Hindus and Muslims. Then in 1906, they set up the All India Muslim League, which was done at the behest of the British. They funded it also. It was set up in Dhaka. And the third was separate electorates. So Muslims will vote for Muslims, Hindus will vote to Muslims. These three developments 
made sure that the problem or the, difficult, the differences between Hindus and Muslims are escalated to the political and constitutional level. And they haven't looked back since then. The Jinnah's issue was that he realized that in the Congress party, so long as Gandhiji, so long as Pandit Nehru, so long as other leaders were there, he didn't have a chance at leadership. So 1930s onwards, with the egging of the British, he started moving away from the Congress. In fact, at one time, he was considered the best brand ambassador for Hindu-Muslim unity. This was the title given to him. But then he started moving away when he realized this. And after, 90, for example, in the 1937 elections, the Muslim League won no seats. And the Congress had formed governments in various... But, you know, that is a, a different story. But this is how the differences of Hindus and Muslims were raised or escalated to the constitutional and political level by these two uh, developments. Okay. Uh, before I let you proceed on this actual timeline, I have another cinematic question for you. Which is that if the British didn't actually further this Hindu-Muslim divide, and if we were entirely one country today, like if Akhand Bharat was a, an actual thing, do you think that would have led to a better present and or future for all of us collectively, Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka? You see, uh, <laughs> that's a very theoretical question. You know, you can go either way. I'm, you can go very either way. I'm sure you've toyed with this idea at some point. Yeah, I, I, you know, being a historian, uh, my background is history. I look at what is or what okay. was. Okay. You know, to uh, speculate is very difficult. There are so many imponderables. Okay. Cool. So one has to look at the way the history developed. You know, once these three developments took place, 1905, 1906, 1909, separate electorates, the die was cast. It was going to happen. It was going to happen. All right. You know, because the uh, once, you know, you tell the Muslim that you're going to vote only for the Muslim and the Hindus only going to the Hindus. So the divide to come, right? Then you have the Muslim League. And what the British did was, and what Jinnah did was, the real fight for India's independence was between the Congress and the British. The Muslim League was a the beneficiary. They got Pakistan on a platter. Hmm. You know, till 1947, till the creation of Pakistan, no Muslim League person ever went to jail for demanding Pakistan. Gandhiji, Pandit Nehru, Zawallabhai Patel, Maulana Azad spent years, decades, in prison for demanding uh, India, for demanding freedom. No one from Muslim League, the only time, in fact, Jinnah went to jail or spent one night in prison was during the annual Cambridge-Oxford boat race in London for unruly behavior. This was way back in the 1890s. That's the only time he spent a night in the clink. Okay. No, no Muslim League leader went to... Uh, whatever sacrifices they talk about happened once the partition plan was announced, the Ratcliffe line and even before that, when the killings started, yeah, Hindu-Muslim killings in Punjab, that's when um, you know they, they suffered. Mm -hmm. But for demanding Pakistan, they, nobody in the Muslim League went to. That had a different adverse consequence, which I'll tell you later on. You know, another source of historical perspective that at least my generation has is movies. There was a movie called Hey Ram, which was about Nathuram Godse, I believe. I can't remember it. All I remember about that movie is how they showcase Hindu-Muslim riots in Bengal. Uh, and this was happening slightly before independence happened. So probably, I'd assume, between 1945 and 1947. Am I right yeah. in saying this is 1946. That? Okay. You see, uh, when this is when uh, Jinnah gave a call for direct action day. And he made this famous uh, statement that we also now have a pistol. He wanted to demonstrate to the British that Hindus and Muslims could not stay together. The cabinet mission plan had give, proposed a confederation. And he wanted to make sure that the British accede to the Muslim League's demand for creation of Pakistan. I have to pause you there a little bit and I have to go one layer deep yeah. and ask you as an observer of Jinnah, uh, what was his actual intention behind this? Did he genuinely believe that, that the Muslims need a separate country? Or as the conspiracy theorists say, is it actually just a chase for being remembered according to the history books? No, he actually, by 1940, you see, when he came back uh, after the 37 elections, he went back for his practice uh, in the UK. Then he came back and he immediately changed his dress, for example. He started wearing the Karkul cap. He started wearing an Achkan and basically an Islamized kind of a, you know, his persona changed. And in 1940, 
at the annual convocation of the All India Muslim League in Lahore, when he articulated this uh, thing um, that you know Hindus and Muslims are two separate nations, and the Muslims are by no means a minority, and therefore they must have their own homeland. And he didn't talk about Pakistan then, but that this is called the Lahore Resolution. And then you had somebody uh, in Cambridge, uh, you know, who gave the acronym of Pakistan. And so for uh, Jinnah, it was not something, um, you know, uh, what you had mentioned. He actually started believing in it, came to it late, but actually started believing in it. Okay, fair. Okay. Because all sorts of people have all sorts of theories on this. Yeah. Like we've had this whole conspiracy theory vibe on the show. I think the audiences are at a point where they want the details of history from someone like yourself. Yeah. So I'll let you proceed with the story. Yeah. So uh, before this, where was I when you... 1946, I believe. Yeah. So direct action day. You know, when Jinnah wanted to uh, convince the British that Hindus and Muslims cannot be together. So then there were these riots in Calcutta where about 4,000 people died. Bulk of them were Hindus. And then Gandhiji went on a fast on to death. And then peace was established. So he wanted to establish this. Mm. That's what happened. Interestingly, in his uh, a book written by the son of uh, Iskandar Mirza, he mentions that Jinnah had contact. That time he was a deputy commissioner of Peshawar, uh, Iskandar Mirza. And he told him that in case the British do not concede Pakistan, then we will have to demonstrate the need for Pakistan by the will of the Muslims. Therefore, he asked him to organize tribal Lashkars. This is in February 1947. To start attacking British and to create communal riots in the northwest frontier province. So that the British would be forced to concede. But then the British had conceded Pakistan. So the Lashkars were not used then, but they were used subsequently as raiders to attack Kashmir. Can you give some context on the word Lashkars? Lashkar is a group, uh, an army or a, uh, it's a tribal uh, conglomeration of tribal um, uh, uh, people. They constitute into a Lashkar. You can call them a militia, you can call them whatever. But it's the traditional word used is Lashkar. Okay. They fight with guns? Yeah, yeah. Guns, okay. swords, whatever they have. Okay. You know. All right. So, uh, Pashtuns. Gotcha. So, these Lashkars were then organized by Iskandar Mirza. They were not used to riot in uh, NWFP, but they were subsequently used in October uh, 47 to attack uh, Kashmir. So Jinnah was, you know, all his life he preached constitutionalism. He did not, in fact, even agree with Gandhiji's movement of non, uh, non-cooperation, you know, or civil disobedience. Yet when it came to the crunch, it was he who gave the orders for direct action day, which led to the killings in Calcutta, as I mentioned, and wanted Iskandar Mirza to create uh, riots in, uh, in WFP. It was basically a, maybe in a way, the immediate cause to create Pakistan finally. Yeah. But they probably sensed that, okay, the British are going to leave. Let's have this as the final straw in the possibility of Pakistan. Yeah. So the 46 was not that the British were going to leave. When he ordered direct action in Calcutta, that is the time when the cabinet mission plan had given a plan for a confederation of India and Pakistan. You know, they were not going to concede Pakistan. So he wanted to demonstrate the need for Pakistan by creating these riots in Calcutta. Okay. That was one. Similarly, by February 47, again, the British had not conceded uh, Pakistan. So he told his condemnation, now you be ready you to create this. So it was to force the British to concede Pakistan. That was the planning. But were the British thinking of leaving the subcontinent already at this point? Yeah. You see, uh, again, it's a very interesting, um, in 19, till 1946, the imperial staff, imperial general staff, believed that a united India would suit British interests after they eventually withdrew from India. Okay. But by 47, they changed their point of view because then they felt that by keeping Pakistan alone, that Pakistan was the more strategically important area of the subcontinent. Why? Because A, closer to the Soviet Union. By the time end of World War II, the Soviet Union was pulling in a different direction. And by that time, the so uh, it was realized, the wells of power, as it was called, the oil of the Middle East, they wanted somebody close enough over there. So the Suez Canal, the Middle East oil and all that. So they felt... And this is documented that their interests of the British Empire would be served best by having a friendly Pakistan. 
with india the problem was that they was suspect they suspected pandit nehru of being too much of a socialist and that he could have developed good relations or friendly relations with the soviet union whereas the case of jinnah and the muslim league there was no question of ever becoming friendly uh, with the soviet union so they felt that their interests could be served best so therefore you know i mean this is going to be a long answer no go for but it. kalat for example as baluchistan was you know balka baluchistan was called initially jinnah mount batten and the khan of kalat agreed that kalat would be an independent country in 1947 damn okay i just wrote an article it was published in the uh, times of india it's part of my book you know on my second third book so they agreed on and the khan of kalat declared independence and there was an embassy of kalat in karachi he set up a bicameral legislature upper house and lower house it was then that the british told him in october 47 that do not concede the independence of kalat make the khan of kalat sign the instrument of accession because by that time they realized that they had to strengthen pakistan because if baluchistan or kalat was not part of then they will not have a border with iran and they wanted because of uh, you know the oil wells and the, so then jinnah started uh, telling the khan of kalat who incidentally was <laughs> uh jena was a lawyer of khan of kalat who argued the case for kalat's independence to the british to the cabinet mission plan kalat had funded jena and funded the muslim league but jena went against him and said you better sign the instrument of accession when he refused the pakistan army sort of picked him up invaded kalat in march 47 picked him up possibly brought him to karachi and made him sign the instrument of accession so yeah. this is one what Ka- was their logic of wanting a separate country kalat because it was an independent country in 1838 and this was reaffirmed by pakistan in 1876 treaty that it will be so kalat unlike the other princely states of india was not regarded as uh, you know it was dealt with by the external affairs department of uh, the british rather than the internal department like nepal like bhutan like sikkim kalat was on that basis damn it was an independent country you know so when this said khan said look i want to be since bara british paramountcy you know you're ending it i want to be independent and uh, jinnah said fine the british said fine and so they signed a stanchel agreement in which and they acceded to kalas independence on the basis of which the khan issued a proclamation so i got to pause you take you into 2023 and then we can return to that timeline yeah. uh in 2023 is the culture of this region that was formerly called kalat is it still very different from the rest of pakistan yes you see the there are two uh, people who inhabit uh, the the baloch and the bravi the bravi are very similar in language to the tamils what the, the, <laughs> the, there are so many common words between tamil and bravi okay you know so at one i mean you know migration took place or what took place there is a lot of similarity Okay. So the 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 Baloch, in fact, the reason for this, I mean, w- 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 how do you say it? Because in 1948, as soon as Kalat was forcibly annexed, the brother of the Khan Abdul Karim rose in rebellion. It was not a very successful rebellion, but it just showed that the Baloch did not accept merger with Pakistan. And there have been a succession of insurgencies: 1948, 1958, 1962. 1973 77 and the current insurgency was started off in 2005 and is continuing for the last 18 years for the same reason yeah they did not accept the forcible accession uh with pakistan in fact in the lower house which was created by the khan there is a very famous speech of ghosbakhs bijinjo it's there on the net when he say that if we are forced and the pakistan forces to uh, you know uh, merge us with pakistan then every baloch son will write in rebellion against pakistan and this is what is happening today and this is basically just culture speaking up right like hey these people have a different culture than us and i'm probably sure there's some historical rivalry also you know see language culture ethnicity the problem of pakistan again we're moving into a different area but let me just spend 2 minutes okay. on this you see the reason why pakistan has not been able to establish an overarching pakistani identity is that the areas that became part of pakistan had never before existed as a single country in the east and the west 
They never before existed as a single country. Even the more compact West Pakistan, they were, the, they were historic states with their own ethnicity, their own culture, their own language. Never before existed together. In fact, Wali Khan, the Pashtun leader, when he was asked in the National Assembly, made this statement that I've been a Pashtun for 4,000 years, a Muslim for 1,300, and a Pakistani only for 40. So for him, his ethnic identity of being a Pashtun was far more important than religion or being a Pakistani. Similarly for the Sindhis, similarly for the Baloch. You know, so this has been one of the major issues in Pakistan that they have not been able to... What Jinnah and thereafter people tried to do was to superimpose a religious Islamic identity on these diverse ethnicities. Now, religion was strong enough, Islam was strong enough to create Pakistan by raising communal frenzy. But it was not glue to keep the various ethnicities together only by the name of religion. In fact, Maulana Azad, in a very good, um, very famous interview that he had uh, with a magazine called Chattan, and his differences with Jinnah was precisely this. He said the Muslim League is demanding Pakistan in the name of Islam. But nowhere in the Quran or in Islam does it say that people of one religion will form a nation. In fact, a qom is all the people living there. And the loyalty of people in India, the Muslims in India, are to their sect. Loyalties is to their sect, not to Islam per se. And this is what happened now, the way Pakistan has developed. You have so much of sectarianism because people are more loyal, whether they're Barelvi, whether they are, um, uh, you know, uh, what do you call, um, Diobandis, Ali Hadis. So there are loyalties to different sects. Is the average Pakistani aware of this? He knows it because on his daily life, he's taught that if you're a Debandi, then the Barelvi is, uh, you know, a Kafir. Or Ali Hadith. In fact, there's a, one of the best documents to command of Pakistan was the Munir Commission report, uh, which was set up after the anti Ahmadiyya riots in 1953 in Lahore. So this Chief Justice Munir and one Justice Kayani, they set up this report and it's called the Munir Commission report. So he asked the ulemas who wanted Ahmadis to be declared non-Muslim. He said, fine. If you want somebody to be declared a non-Muslim, you must first of all know who is a Muslim? Only then can you say this man is not a Muslim. And they write, and this is documented. They say, much to our regret, they asked about 16 or 20 ulemas of different sects, the who is a Muslim? And none of them could agree on the definition of a Muslim. Each one defined it as per his sect. And they write that if you accept the definition of A, then for those 15 other people, you go out of the pale of Islam. They will treat you as kafir. So there is no definition of being who is a Muslim. This is what Azad was telling Jinnah. Yet, by raising communal frenzy, the fear of the Hindu. The fear of the Hindu. Yeah, you know, uh, you will be old by Hindu. Okay. You know, that's why they created the country, but then they couldn't keep it together in the name of Islam. Bangladesh broke away because for the Bengalis, language was far more important part of their identity than religion. But even till today. When they raised this Islam in danger in the frontier, for example, the Pashtuns laughed at them. They were 96% Muslims. They said, we are 96% and you think Islam is in danger because of 4% Hindus and Sikhs? So the Muslim link did, you know, did very badly in the NWFU, which was the largest Muslim province in India in 37. But by 47, the situation had changed. And the very interesting thing of the Pashtuns and NWFE, which we can talk about uh, whenever you uh, later on in the show. Or now. Or now, okay, <laughs> fine. So, in the last elections, 46 elections, guess who won the elections in the province? It was the Congress Khudai Khidmatgar government. And it was the chief minister was Dr. Khan Saab, who was the brother of Abdul Ghaffar Khan. Now, this was a terrible thing for the, for the British were concerned. Because if Pakistan was to be viable, then this Muslim majority province had to be a part of Pakistan, not be beholden to the, as I said, Hindu Congress. So Lord Ismay, who was Mountbatten's chief of staff, called it a bastard situation, where the majority Muslims had voted for the Congress. So they said this verdict has to be upturned. And to do that, even though elections were held on 46, they said we have to have a referendum 
whether the assembly whether the people want pakistan or india even because they were afraid you see this uh, resolution of uh, partition was given to each provincial assembly to whether they wanted to accede to india whether they wanted to accede to pakistan they feared that if this resolution was given to the nwfa assembly they would vote for india because it was a congress khudai khidmatkar majority they said no 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 we must have a referendum for reasons that i am not uh, fully aware of the congress agreed to this the congress leadership in delhi agreed to this so the congress in nwfp had opposed it but the congress agreed to it and and this is when abdul gafar khan told gandhi ji you have thrown us to the wolves can we dive a little bit deeper into why the congress in delhi was for it could there have been geopolitical reasons or pressure from the british saying hey you better agree to this because these I, are I, our, I, uh, I i think it, i i'm not i mean i am not in a, a position to tell you why but i think by that time the congress party wanted the british to leave and mount batten put his foot down that look if you don't accept this referendum the whole partition plan is off i am leaving so i think they were sort of blackmailed into accepting there was also a question of distance you know pakistan in between nwfp and all that but if there could be east and west pakistan east and west india could have been a thing there could have been a different well it's a historical fact of you know but this is abdul gafar khan was so upset he told gandhi ji you have thrown us to the wolves you know apne bheediyon ke aage hame phenk diya was that an accurate statement based on how the future panned out yeah why because the way the muslim league was you see the muslim league jinnas thing were there only two nationalities hindus and muslims there are two successors to the british the congress and the muslim league if the if they accepted pashtun as a nationality then his whole scheme would be rendered infructuous so therefore he dismissed khan saab's government within a week of uh, pakistan's coming uh, into you know when pakistan pakistan was created and even though the khan brothers saw religions to pakistan abdul gafar khan spent more years in jail in pakistan than he did while he was under the british really yeah he, he they couldn't accept the pashtun and because he demanded that look he said look we've just had an election in 46 on the basis of hindu uh, india and pakistan if you want to have a referendum we're not scared of a referendum but then it, it must be on the issue of pashtunistan to give us the option of pashtunistan pashtun territory where the pashtuns unified pashtuns all over british india are able to have their own self governance mount batten rejected that it can only be in india and pakistan so then they boycotted the referendum once they boycotted the referendum naturally the majority of the people it was a limited franchise it was not that everybody voted it was a very limited franchise and 90% of that or i don't know forget the percentage of those people then voted for pakistan and it was a foregone conclusion would you like to close this jinnah chapter now i i leave it to you or whatever we want see before we close this and the historical portion i mentioned right in the beginning the genetic fault lines of pakistan it's very important for your viewers to understand that why is pakistan today a troubled and troublesome state you see jinnah as i mentioned he said hindus and muslims and but how do you get the muslims to vote for you because in the areas that became west pakistan the congress league was very weak i mean the muslim league was very weak in punjab there was a coalition government of hindus muslims and sikhs in nwfp there was a congress government only in sindh was the muslim league had a presence now jinnah was opposed to mass mobilization he was opposed to land reform because bulk of his supporters were landlords so how do you enthuse the muslims to vote for you religion so the slogan became pakistan ka matlab kya and the answer was the kalma la ilaha illallah and in the 45 46 elections they said this is a fight between this is a fight for islam even when the contest was between two muslims they said ek taraf islam ka namainda hai dusri taraf kufr ka namainda hai or this is a fight between haq aur batil right and wrong so he unleashed the genie of religion mm. at that time and since then pakistan has not been able to put the genie back because once you unleash forces like this ke pakistan ka matlab kya then the islamic parties the religious parties got after it ki pakistan ban gaya ab to is it should be a islamized state 
for then him to talk like he did in his famous August 11th speech of the, you're free to go to your temples, you're free to go to your mosques and you know, is it where? This is uh, created on the basis of Islam, on the basis of two nation theory. So then you had the objective resolution, anti Ahmadiyya riots, Ahmadiyya has been declared non-Muslims and finally ended up with Zia who started this whole process of Islamization. So one big genetic fault line in Pakistan started by Jinnah was the injection of religion into politics. Uh, this was an example of using religion to unite a bunch of people and tell people that, listen, you guys need a separate country. But in the long term, this backfired in some ways. Absolutely. Because for a lot of the locals in Pakistan, they identify more as the ethnicities rather than the religions, or at least historically they did so. Yeah. So uh, just two days ago or yesterday, about 15 churches in Faisalabad have been burnt down on the basis of somebody who was supposed to have done something, you know, called blasphemous. So the mobs went on the rampage and they burnt down so many churches, destroyed the cross and much of the chairing uh, of, you know, uh, uh, volunteers of the Tehri ke party. So it will not going to stop. And this all tricks races back to that. So this is one major fault line that Pakistan has become so radicalized and so Islamized that it is, you know, in the future... It will be very difficult to pull back. I'll give you a very an example, a very gruesome example. Some years ago in Okada, district of Okada, there was a rural gathering where the Malvi asked a question and a poor 14-year-old boy raised his hand by mistake. Malvi said, Gustav ke Rasul, you have committed blasphemy. And the congregation also pounced on them. This poor boy felt so overwhelmed that he went in the nearby field and using a fodder-cutting machine cut off his own hand. Oh, came back and presented it to the on a plate to the Malvi and people cheered. It was such a gruesome act that the nation, which is the major daily, the English news daily, wrote that if a person is willing to hurt himself in the name of religion, can you imagine what he would do to others? So this is the kind of radicalization and Islamization that has gone on. Today in the same city, same mohalla, you have different kinds of mosques. Teaching, first thing they will say that he is a Diobandi, he is a He is he's not the right thing. The Diobandi will be saying the Ali Hadith and the Barilvis are. So, this kind of sectarianism, this kind of hatred is being created even among the Muslim sects. So, you can imagine what's going to happen to the others, the minorities. Minorities are sitting ducks. Uh, what I've come to realize about the average urban Pakistani is that they're not that uh, extremist. But in saying that, what you said, uh, prior to this, which is that if you make a country based on religion, eventually that thought is going to come back to bite you. Because in the modern day, uh, being secular is an important part of modern day countries. That's what I feel. Uh, please, you can disagree with me if you think I'm saying But not in the case of Pakistan. What is secularism in Pakistan? You know, they are a 98% Muslim country divided into various sects. Mm. And they are fed this daily dose not only in madrasas, in government schools, okay, through textbooks and uh, on sermons in the uh, in the mosque. So, what will happen in the I think the point I was making was that uh, I have met the urban elite of Pakistan the same way that I am the urban elite of India. Uh, when we meet, there's friendliness, there's brotherhood. And then there's the masses who are... Uh, affected by what they see in the news media. They are affected by the original religious thoughts of Pakistan. They are the extremists. But unfortunately, this might be more than 99% of the country. Because we are just probably meeting the 1% that find the way to Dubai, that find the way into content creation. Am I right? Would you like to correct me? Yeah, no, that's true. You see, it's okay. depends on the milieu in which you meet uh, people. You meet them in Dubai, you meet them in London, you meet them in the US. One, you meet them in, in Pakistan. It's a, it's a different uh, attitude because they're living in that milieu, no? Day in and day out, if you are bombarded. Look, I'll tell you simply. Kaida, you know, like A for Apple, B for every child who goes to nursery, re reads that. The Kaida, which I've seen myself, Zers is Alim. And there's a photograph of a Sadar. Man of a five-year-old five boy, what do you think image he's going to have of a Sadar? Zalim? Der se Daku. There's a Hindu with a fat tone and a bodhi. So in the mind of a child, Hindus are dakus. And that gets reinforced by the textbooks 
in government schools there are studies carried out by pakistani think tanks the one very famous one called the subtle subversion by the sustainable policy development institute of islamabad they actually document what are the themes that are taught to children and how distorted how they distort the version of history and things like pakistan is for muslims alone islam hindus hated against hindus jews and christians they are the enemies of pakistan enemies of islam this is all document this is actually being taught in pakistani schools now this is something which people in india perhaps don't realize i mean i mentioned this in my book that my book has been in the market for 2016 and no pakistani has disputed it an intellectual has even called it as the best book on pakistan because the, the, the thinking pakistani and they realize what is going wrong with their society and they are the brilliant uh, pakistanis they are helpless they are not able to go flow against the tide so if you enjoyed this video make sure you check out this playlist for more videos just like this it's the artist clips